Hi everyone, my name is Owen Magab Inao, and welcome to HYVA, which stands for Hire Your Virtual Assistant.com. And one of the things I do on this blog is I go out there looking for you know successful entrepreneurs who I can bring on the show so that we can cover a specific topic or two and you know get you guys to learn something from them. And today I have Eleanor Stutz from smoothsale.net. And, you know, one of the things I see Eleanor do a lot is that, you know, she's been able to go out there to promote her business by making use of social media, you know, speaking a lot on you know, different uh, speaking circuits, as well as making use of her book to promote her business. And I feel, you know, I figure that there is something that we as entrepreneurs can learn from that. And so I, you know, invited Eleanor on the show today. So Eleanor, first of all, please introduce yourself to the audience and tell them what you do. Thank you so much, Owen. I'm Eleanor Stutz, and my business is Smooth Sale, a sales training company. I took everything that I learned in corporate sales into my entrepreneurship, but I quickly learned that my marketing communication was off, and so I began devouring marketing materials, and that's where I learned how to combine many different resources and make a, a wider variety sales training business. Uh, people were afraid of the word sale or sell, particularly women, so they didn't like the fact I announced I was a sales trainer, and the men didn't think I could possibly know enough to be a trainer. So one of the first things I did that I read in the marketing materials was that I needed to write a book to become uh, credible. And so I didn't pay attention to any of the statistics. I just thought, okay, I need to write a book. That's what I'm going to do. And I wrote about my corporate experiences, the hard lessons learned, what worked best, and how other people can pick up my book and begin selling more effectively. That was my goal. Well, you'll never guess what happened. It was entitled, Nice Girls Do Get the Sale, Relationship Building That Gets Results. Yeah. It was fe featured in Time Magazine, translated into several languages, and today it's an international bestseller. Wow. It beyond my expectations. That's all I have to tell you, and it did build my credibility. And I'm and curious to that, as to you, you said that uh, you, you learned from somewhere that having a book helps to build credibility. First of all, you know, where was that in this? And also, I want to also get into detail as to comparing how, you know, you going out there to talk to people about your business before you had the book and, you know, now that you had the book, how that has really changed as well. Oh, it changed tremendously because most people apparently think about writing a book but never do it. So they knew I had perseverance. That's number one. Number two, that a well-known publisher would pick up the book, that was huge credibility. Number three, I got an advance which most authors do not get. So on my first try, I got this great publisher and boom, it was in Time Magazine. People's eyes opened up and they began to ask me to speak and that's how the process all began. It was really with the book. And, and what was the process for writing this book? Uh, I'm sure there had to be some challenges involved with that because sometimes the audience may also learn from the challenges you face. You know, so what was the process for that? Well, you always hear about writing blockages, etc. And I'm very brief when I communicate, so the hard part for me was to fill up 200 pages. <laughs> But what I did, since it was the sales book, I mentally walked myself through my corporate career. It was over 11 years. And all the stories that stood out in my mind, and I took it in chronological order from the beginning to the end, and wrote down all those crazy things that happened to me. In the beginning, the men tried to force me out because they didn't believe a woman could sell. This was back in the 90s. Wow. And so people say the books laugh out loud funny, but I have great information in there. And I just recalled all the stories because when you tell stories, whether you speak or you write, it draws the audience in. So that's a very important factor to understand when you're starting to write your own book. And people want self-help books on, you know, what was your hard lesson, how did you overcome it, and what can I do to speed up the learning curve and not encounter all that. So I put everything in. And in terms of, you know, being able to brainstorm the content of what should have been in the book, uh, what was your process for doing that? Like, you know, how, how did you approach the process of you know, 
figuring okay what goes in first what comes at last you know how did you organize the book as well I'm getting at okay um, on that one it was just following my corporate career and, and there was no magic to that one my second book on how to interview better I claim that it follows the sales cycle and so I wrote out the first chapter was called salesology on the order of the steps you have to take to make a successful sale and then I wrote the chapters on interviewing to follow the sales cycle so that it made sense so it I believe it depends on your subject matter and it all has to be in order so that it makes sense to the reader you can't skip back and forth and you said something about how you know having stories integrated into the the book helps to keep the uh, you know uh, the the listen the reader you know engaged and uh, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how does that also play, because I know now that you're also in the speaking circuit, how does that also play into what you do as a speaker? Again, when you tell a personal story, people have, are really intent on listening. You have their attention. And you tell stories that bring emotion. You make the audience laugh. You make them be introspective with some kind of deep thought about soul searching, for instance, and what they're trying to bring into the world to help other people. And then you might give them solutions to the problems of what, you know, why you were asked to speak, what the group is most interested in. So the key to all of this is to know your audience first, who's in the audience and why the organizer wants you there. And then you de deliver a well-rounded talk where you address a problem, possible solutions, and what the outcome will be with these short stories to illustrate the examples. And then people are really drawn into it and want more information. Okay. And one of the things we promised the uh, listeners when we got started was that you've been able to successfully integrate uh, the social media part of it with your the book as well as the speaking and first of all how, how exactly did you even get into social media in the first place well I, I was getting marketing help by Malachi Drew and she unveiled this idea of whispering energy where it would be global she teach people social media and I thought okay I'm in I, I want to learn this was two years over two years ago so it was kind of the leading edge and I quickly recognized Twitter was a valuable tool. I, I mentioned before I'm a very direct communicator and quick. So Twitter was perfect for me. And rather than put out links continually, you know, triple your money, click here, or I just ate a peanut butter sandwich, I put out helpful tips that other people could read and implement immediately. Many of them were taken from my books or my articles. And then only occasionally put a link after a short tip. Well, what happened from there was six other people asked me to contribute a chapter to their books. And I was asked to speak on a number of different platforms, online conventions and in-person conventions. So a lot of opportunity came from there. And the people who connected with me on Twitter as a result of what I put out, we then had further conversations, many of us, on Facebook where you can have longer messages. So one led to another to led to another. And when I built up a big following on Facebook too, then I was able to message a lot of people about webinars or local events or the next thing that I was doing. So they both became a valuable vehicle for attracting people to to my business and all the different activities that I offer. So I, I guess my question now for Twitter is really, uh, um, uh, the first question is, you know, in terms of the content, you say you, you, you put very direct content as to, you know, useful tips and all that, but is, is this something where you, you, you just put the, you know, send tweets on the fly or do you organize a whole collection of tweets that you organize and say, okay, using a tool saying, you know, there is going to be a frequency of you know posting this uh, uh, information over and over again based on the schedule. How exactly do you work that? Well, you know, that's a brilliant question because it's very, very time consuming. And so I created over a period of time 
1,300 tweets, which is a lot, right? Wow, I, yeah. It took a lot of time and was from many different materials that I already had written, but I just had to get it in the form of tweets. And then I take advantage of a service called mbono.net. So if you want the link, it's http colon slash slash m is in Mary, yeah. b is in boy, mm -hmm. o, n is in Nancy, o, dot net. Okay. And it automates your tweets. If there's a monthly fee for it, I believe it's fourteen ninety five. It automates everything, and so I don't have to worry about it. I'm tweeting when I'm asleep, so that's that's how I get it done. However, during the day between projects, I'll bring up my home page, and I'll quickly run down the list of what's on my home page. You know, other people's tweets. And the ones that I really like, I'll retweet them. That's a very good thing to be doing, too, is to retweet other people who you share the same message with. Okay, so basically I see that you're taking the time to schedule out a, 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 a bunch of tweets that based on your own content, right? And you use this right. tool called mbono.net to schedule them. And the, the question I have is, is it, okay, you have, in your case, you have 1,300 separate tweets. And on, in each of these tweets, is there like a link back to a specific uh, call to action on your website, maybe like a webinar or, uh, or maybe like them signing up for a specific program or is just direct tweets that have no um, call to action back to something you want them to do? Well, that, that is the key that I learned through Whispering Energy. You, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the time, time absolutely no link you just let people get to know who you are and what you stand for and what you believe 20 to 30 percent of the time you add a link okay. and here's here's another tip for Twitter you're allowed 140 characters but you want people to retweet you too so that your name gets spread right yeah all right so you want to deduct your identifier so for me I'm at smooth sale I want to deduct the character spaces for RT, which stands for retweet, the space, and the at smooth sale. So I'm really only allowed 125 character spaces for any tweet plus a link that I put out. And that way, people can easily retweet me without have to, having to cut and paste. They just do retweet. So the whole key to making a sale or getting people to retweet you is to make it easy for the other party. And this makes it real easy. And definitely, you also said that, you know, so during the day when you're sending out this information on Twitter, is there a, a limit in each day that you're going to amount of messages that will be sent out using the automated uh, system that you have? Well, because I have so many, I believe it goes out every 15 minutes now. But initially, it was once an hour. Wow. So, 24 a day. And as you get new ideas that you want to tweet about, you know, especially if it's tweets that you feel is going to be uh, something that people will find useful over on, on an ongoing basis, I guess you then add it to the original set of 1,300 tweets you have. You just keep adding onto it, and it basically decides how to tweet them out. Is that the case? Exactly, because you don't want people to quickly recognize that you're, you're repeating over and over again. And so another thing to do, there was a website, unfortunately I don't remember the name, but uh, you can look up famous quotes, and uh, you know many well-known people are quoted on that site, and you can copy and paste those as long as you attribute the uh, name of the person who made the original quote. So that's another way to get extra ones into your database. Definitely. So I, I get that point. 70% uh, or 80% of the time, it's going to be direct content that you've created, but there's no link back. And maybe the other 20% is call to action back to something that you want them to do. But that's based on your content. You also said that uh, you do something where you look out for uh, content that's out there that you know you think is relevant, not necessarily you, but then you retweet it. Right, but I'm, yeah. I'm I'm noticing with those retweets that they also have a link attached to the person's content, right? So do you have those links attached to the person's content? What, what do you do in that respect when you're retweeting someone else's uh, material? Most of the time, I don't. Only occasionally. So how do they get access to the content if if you're not retweeting the person's uh, URL for them to go to the person's information? 
I I, re, I add their their name is included in it, so people can look their name up on the internet. Oh, okay, okay. So I, I guess that in that case, you're taking out the key points that you saw in that article, and then you put it in in there, in the tweet. I, I'm I just want to really get to know what exactly you're using when it comes okay. to the whole let, Twitter process. Right. Let me clarify that I only retweet good tips or inspirational quotes. That's all I retweet. I never retweet the links. Okay. Uh, the quotes with the links, I don't, I don't retweet those. Just, just the ones like I do, the short tips or inspirational quotes. That's it. Okay, I guess I probably have to rethink my own process because usually when I see, when I see someone's uh, content that I like, I usually just uh, you know, retweet it with the link in there so that people can go in and see more details but i'm glad you you know uh, explained that a lot and then now back to you know your, i guess part of the call to action is to get them to maybe attend like a speaking engagement or something that you are uh you're you're, you're, you're basically conducting how exactly does one you know go about getting started in this whole speaking uh, uh circuit thing where you're going out there to market your business via speaking and teaching people Okay, well, my whole thing is building relationships. So as you go out networking or connect through Skype, you get to know people well. And the first thing is to find out what they're looking for. It's part of making a sale. You find out where their interest lies first, if there's a match between what you offer and what they're looking for. And if there is, then you position it so that what you have to offer is of interest to them and let them know you would like to speak to their group or you have something to teach or you have a blog or articles you'd like to share. That's how it all begins. It's a baby step at a time, but first get to know the associations in your area, get to know the other people well, and then you tell them how you fit into what they're trying to achieve and see if they'd be interested. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yes it does. And but one of the things that people say is the hardest things to to get involved in is actually public speaking. Uh, I mean, how did you get past the challenge, if if at all you had that, of actually you know getting in front of people and actually just you know, speaking and getting the content out there? What were the tricks or means okay. you used to get past that? That's uh, that goes back a long ways. Um, when I was in sales, I'm pretty new at it. I used to just get scared to death having a meeting with a CEO of a company. So I signed up for Dale Carnegie three-month class to take public speaking. I didn't even announce my name in front of a group. I was so scared. By the end of the class, I was the grand prize winner because I just loved being on stage as it turned out. I just had to get over my shyness, and I did. And then when it came to me being an entrepreneur, I initially was speaking to small groups of 25 and then one day out of the blue a phone rang and I was asked to give a keynote in front of 600 people. And yeah, I was scared once again. And luckily a speech coach had seen me speak to one of the smaller groups. So I called her up because she knew my style and asked her to help me, which she did. And by the time I went on stage to that very large group, I was very comfortable and gave uh, a very well welcomed talk. So uh, it's about saying yes to opportunity and then getting the help you need. You have to remember to say yes. But yeah, and, and also I'm, I'm curious, what are the, uh, you know, the baby step ways in which you know, entrepreneurs who want to get out there and speak you know, in, eventually to large audiences, what are the baby steps ways that they can use to get started with the process of speaking? And any ideas come to mind? Well, I know a lot of people start out, if they don't want to pay a lot of money for expensive classes, is to go to, um, oh my goodness, the name just escaped me. It, it's, a local, it's in many, many areas where you can go and speak. I forgot the name of the organization. I apologize. No problem. Uh, but you can Google it, you know, for speaking, and if you give webinars or do little workshops, you get accustomed to being in front of audiences, and that helps tremendously. Okay, so you're saying even making use of webinars that you throw on your own website, maybe like to a group of 10, 20 people that, you know, want to learn, that itself also helps to uh, enhance
enhance your speaking uh, experience, I guess. It does because you have to organize your material, you have to organize your thoughts, you have to listen to the questions and answers succinctly, and it has to make sense to your audience. And if you do it in a small group, the first few times also are nerve wracking. Even though I already spoke to 600 people, the first time I did a webinar, once again I was a nervous wreck. But by the fifth time, it became very comfortable. Everything takes practice. That's the whole key. You've got to practice, practice, practice until it becomes comfortable. Definitely. So, is it my assumption that uh, your main means of being out there in the public and getting people to be aware of you, what you're doing, is through the books, the uh, social media, as well as the speaking? What other mediums do you use to still attract people or customers or clients back to you? Uh, your business. I write a blog that gets nice traffic and then I contribute articles to a couple to a magazine um, and that's well read and to another blog that's that rated the number five in the world so that that brings in a lot of traction too. So it's just finding multiple ways to extend what you have to say. Long ago I heard that every venue that you create, you need to figure out how to extend it to the power of 10. So may I give you what that means? Go ahead. I was about to ask you that. Okay. So if you have one service or product, you have one audience. If you have three products or services, you have a potential audience of six because you multiply down three times two times one. If you take it to ten, it's I think 3.2 million. Ten times nine times eight all the way down to one. It's exponential. So say you write a blog. You extend it into an article send it to another site, you can do an interview, you can have your own online radio show and interview other people, yeah. you can put a part of that blog onto a Facebook message, you can take one strong line from that blog and put it into a tweet. Do you see where I'm going with this? Definitely. Everything you do has to go the power of 10. And that's how you more quickly spread the word about what you're doing and increase your audiences. Definitely, I understand, you know, the, the, I guess basically they need to syndicate whatever content you create, right? Is, is that what you're saying exactly? Uh, just finding different venues from it. Sure, syndication is great, but just find different ways you can use the same material, expand it, contract it, whatever, and uh, in different ways use the same thing so you're not wasting your time recreating the wheel all the time. You have something in place and then you can go with it in multiple ways and then when you have enough articles and blogs that can become a book definitely and one thing that one who is thinking of you know by the means of uh, uh, teaching people uh, something within your niche as a means to generate leads I mean if, if one is going to be blogging and doing all these things mm -hmm. it, it, it might seem to a point where it feels like if you're not doing it there's nothing coming in so how, how can one avoid that situation where uh, what I'm trying to say is how can one get to a point where you are you know, getting to reuse the content you've actually spent time to, to create? Well, requests will come in. Would you, if they see your blog, requests start coming in. Uh, would you like to contribute to my blog? Would you like to write an article? Would you like to be a guest on my radio show or on a TV station? It, it's amazing when you stay true to what you want to do and keep doing it, people find you. And then word of mouth begins to grow and you get the referrals. And, and one of which, 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 uh, which things have you done on your blog specifically or in terms of your content creation on your blog that you think ha help to get the most kind of traction uh, from audience or even more people sharing it? If you can give us some uh, examples of ideas of what you've done. Well, actually, yesterday, I think that was the most uh, heavy traffic I ever had, and it was about sticking to your principles no matter who you're talking to. Because uh, when you are consistent and always truthful, that's a part of your brand, and people recognize it. And then they trust you, have confidence in you, and want to do work with you, or you're interviewing. The hiring manager will sense that about you and more opportunity will come your way. So 
the talk about consistency and truthfulness and you know how you react one way with rel with uh, friends and then it might be another way with relatives and how do you resolve all of this and when conflict arises that got a lot of traction yesterday definitely I understand I understand the concept but is, is do you think there was something specific that allowed that uh, um, um, blog post to resonate with a lot of people is, is there some method to how you create your blog post that helps with that? Oh, how I created it. I always use it from my personal experience, what I observe in the field, what I see as being done incorrectly, and how it can be improved, or what I really like, and I, truthfully, I happen to have a conflict with somebody, and so that brought to mind how an entrepreneur should interpret all of this and how to deal with it. Definitely. So I think one of the things I'm getting from that is that you, you tend to use a lot of, you know, stories and personal experience when yes. you're communicating with a lot of people via this different medium so that it, it, it really, go ahead. Well, when I'm speaking, as I share the storytelling in my, in all forms of my writing, it's always based upon personal experience because I feel other people can learn from my experiences if I'm a couple steps ahead of them. And again, help them shorten the learning curve. That's my motto: is to help other people coming up behind me. Definitely. So tying everything back together, because at the end of the day, we're all doing this so that you know. You know I guess the idea is you're putting out content that you know your audience will find useful, so that eventually they come back to you. So how how does one really you know tie this you know all this content generation you're doing and through the different mediums? In your case, social media, books, and also present uh, uh, speaking. How do you, how does the entrepreneur listening to this now, how does, how do they tie everything back to them getting these leads that eventually turn to clients? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I was trying to figure out how do you, how do you tie the whole means of uh, putting content out there back to these people leading to uh, actual clients of yours? Because at the end of the day, that's what we really want, right? If, if you're just oh. putting out the content and it's not doing anything, yeah. or bringing you, uh, <laughs> you know, clients who eventually turn to an income, then there's really no business. I'm trying to figure out what, what's that bridge? How do you bridge those two things together? Content to eventual clients. Okay, so People see my information, they like it, they contact me for more information. In a blog, I will put links to both my books and my website so they can find more information. If I'm talking about, you know, want people wanting to author a book, I happen to be starting a webinar on how to write a book and sell more copies online. So I'd have a link to that. Um, always at the end, I always deliver a lot of value up front. And then at the end, whether I'm speaking or resources page at the end of my books or my blog at the bottom, I will say, if you enjoy this information, here's how you can reach me. Or here's more information you might be able to need, what, you know, want to seek out with the link. So I let people know further steps they can take to further engage with me. Plus, I also offer private coaching and team training. Definitely. So I guess in, in that sense, is you deliver the good content, but at the end of the day, you also put that call to action, which is not necessarily an overt, you know, come and buy from me, but it's, it, it gets them to raise their hand and go through the process to eventually buy from you, I guess. Exactly. I'm not a pushy salesperson. I don't like that style. So I like to demonstrate what I can do. And then those people that are attracted to my style will connect with me one way or another, whether it's social media or by phone or email. Definitely. I've, I've really enjoyed how you, you know broke down the entire process of what, what you've been doing and turning content into actual uh, sales and you know, leads and clients. And just for that uh, audience member that's listening to this whole, uh, you know, uh, interview so far and trying to figure out how best they can go out there and kind of you know educate clients or you know or even potential clients of what the benefits or what exactly they do in their business uh, what is that one thing you want to leave with them today in this interview to, to, to get them started with the process of just even getting started in the first place well the first thing is to really know what it is you enjoy doing and what you want to accomplish and then set a plan and action. 
And with that, very often they're detours. And you have to understand it's not a straight path to success. Be committed to continually educate yourself. I think that's the biggest key. People give up and say it's too hard or I'm losing money or it takes too much of an investment. But if you keep reading, keep asking questions and taking courses, you'll get the information you need much more quickly and you'll be able to advance forward far more quickly. So get the help you need. That I think that's critically important. And I always, always, every six months, look at where I'm headed, what's worked well, and what needs to be tweaked, and what other type of information I need. And then I go after it and, go, and get it. Yeah, and I noticed that too a lot because, you know, uh, one of the things you said in, during this interview is how you always go out there and seek information from people who can teach you how to improve on several things in your business. Like you said, how you, you got someone out there was in social media, learned what they were doing, and now you're doing the same thing in your business and also with the speaking and all that. So that's that's a very good point. And in case any one of the audience members is listening to this and want to get a hold of you, how best can they do that? Well, my toll-free number is 800-704-1499. And my email is Eleanor, E-L-I-N-O-R, at smoothsale, S-M-O-O-T-H-S-A-L-E dot net. And one more time, the phone number is 800-704-1499. And I'm very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for doing the interview. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Owen. It was a pleasure. I like this Skype. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And before you go, I want you to do me a favor. I'm trying to build my community of entrepreneurs who find my content useful on Facebook so we can engage, you know, have discussions live right there on Facebook. And to get to my page on Facebook, you go to www.facebook.com forward slash H-Y-V-A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-T. And again, it's www.com. What am I saying? No, it's www.facebook.com forward slash H-Y-V-A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-T. And when you get there, what you're going to do is look for the uh, a button that says like, and you click on that button, and then basically you uh, become a, a fan of the page. It's that simple. You don't even have to leave me your email. Just click on the button that says like. And again, the page to go to is www.facebook.com forward slash H-Y-V-A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-T. And that stands for Hive Assistance. Real easy. I look forward to seeing you on Facebook. Have a great day.